Hi friends, and welcome to the latest webisode in this series sponsored by our friends at Lucid, who have recently released Lucid Spark, their virtual collaborative whiteboarding tool, which I'm very excited about. Today's topic, keeping your swim lane diagrams useful and relevant, or your workflow models useful and relevant, as I might call them. So it's worth going back in time and remembering why swim lane diagrams became popular in the first place. First of all, the relative simplicity of the tool doesn't try to do too much. It shows us who, the actors, what they do, the steps, and when they do it, the flow lines. And if you draw these according to some of the guidelines I'm gonna share, they're very popular with business people. First, because sequence and dependency are clearly visible from left to right. They're simple enough that anyone can follow one of these. They show all of the actors and therefore all interactions and handoffs. And they stop at the point where we say what the actor is doing without getting into the details of how. Because these tools are really not that good for detail. Other job aids like procedures, checklists, and decision trees are better tools. So we've looked at four reasons why they work. And for each of these is a common error that I see all the time when I'm coaching people. First, concealing flow by drawing a convoluted diagram that goes back and forth and up and down using symbols that regular folks don't understand, omitting actors just because they're perceived as playing a minor role, and getting into procedural level detail. In today's webisode, we're going to examine those first two a little more closely. In the next webisode on staying out of the weeds, I'll examine the latter two. So, two of my core principles, flow first, detail later, and simplicity is a virtue. So I want you to lock in on this phrase. The purpose of a workflow model is to show the flow of work, although many or most of them don't. So whatever you call these, if you draw them, what I would say is properly, they are a great tool for showing flow, the interdependency of steps. Now, I've got a sample diagram here for you, and I know it's too small for you to read the steps, but I just want you to look at the graphic elements. I drew this several years ago to help a group of business executives make an important decision. We printed it out in large format, put it on a boardroom table, and walked through it. And nobody had any trouble following it because the flow was strictly from left to right, and the symbols were simple essentially just boxes and lines, and it helped them make an important process-based decision. Now, does everybody follow those guidelines? Well, no. A quick Google Images search shows us a lot of different diagramming styles. One example that I came across recently, I've reproduced here in Lucidchart. I haven't included the step names or, or the, the labels on the flows. I just want to look at the graphic elements. And I think it was a, an accurate diagram, didn't have too many different symbols, but I found the colors a little distracting. More concerning were points where there was multiple flows associated with a step. So right here, I don't know, do we need both of these flows to trigger this step or only one of them? Similarly over here where one flow joins another, does that mean they both end up at this lower step or just one of them? And over here, I have a flow line that splits and goes in two directions. Do we follow both of them or just one of them? Of even more concern is the lack of an overall direction. The flows on this diagram go in every direction. And why is that? Because the lure of the one pager is so powerful. So I really urge you to think twice before you cram a swim lane diagram into a one pager, because if you do, you're defeating the graphic power of the diagram. 
If you do need a one-pager, and we all do, then I suggest the augmented scope model. So what we do here is a form of decomposition. We add more detailed activities under the major phases or activities of the process. Initially, just in verb noun form, later adding the who and the how, as I've indicated here. And this leads to an interesting observation from recent years. I've stressed earlier, always before doing any swim lane diagramming, I draw a scope model. So I know where the process begins and where it ends. I almost always draw a summary chart to illustrate the cross-functional nature of the process, and I usually do the augmented scope model as well. And what we're seeing is if we do that, we often do not need an as-is swim lane diagram. The augmented scope model is enough. So that saves us time and energy for saving for the to-be phase. So, Sequence and dependency flow are very important, and we convey that with how we draw the diagram. And this one here is a good example of what not to do. We've tried to compress the diagram into less real estate, but now it looks to the human mind like these steps on the left are happening in parallel, even though the flow lines tell us they're happening as part of a sequence. And that's important because sequential versus parallel, dependent versus independent are important aspects of process analysis. So I wouldn't draw it like this. I would draw the exact same flow as I've indicated here. And yes, it takes up more real estate, but now we can clearly see it is a single threaded, entirely sequential process flow. And I'm also illustrating an important guideline that I always follow. Flow lines only leave the right-hand edge of the step and only enter the left-hand edge, never the top or bottom. And that ties in with how we perceive diagrams, the cognitive psychology of diagramming, if you want. And I saw a great presentation a few years ago where the speaker explained to us what cognitive psychologists have learned about what people perceive initially when they see a diagram, any kind of diagram. And the first thing people notice is relative size. So a larger symbol is seen as more important than a smaller symbol. So my advice, keep them all the same size unless you're trying to make a particular point. Second, we notice the relative x, y position. So we are going to infer some meaning from how these steps are spread out left to right on the x-axis and up and down on the y-axis. And if I express those in swim lane format, we can see that a swim lane diagram drawn properly is ideally suited for rapid uptake by people because the x-axis shows us the flow time, sequence, dependency, and the y-axis organizes it by the various actors. So let's keep that in mind. Also, keep in mind using the simplest possible set of symbols, unlike this sample a student shared with me several years ago. So the great architect Mies van der Rohe is known for having said, less is more. And that is absolutely true when we're diagramming for a business audience. So we have many symbols available to us in the typical flowchart template, but I'm gonna restrain myself and stick to boxes and lines. Okay? Sometimes just boxes as per when I'm laying out my initial flow model, either virtually or in, in real life with post-its. Okay, more on this technique in the next webisode. So later, I'm going to add some rigor, but I'm still focusing on flow in, and simplicity once I've put the diagram into Lucidchart. Now, some of you at this point might be thinking, wait a minute, BPMN has lots of symbols and we're a BPMN shop. Well, yes, there are lots of symbols, but you are not obligated to use them all. And it's useful to remember 
why we have all those symbols. And the reason is BPMN was originally a visual programming language for automated workflow. A point that was made by Bruce Silver just a few days ago in a blog post. Uh, by the way, his book is a great reference for making best use of BPMN. So I'm going to advise extreme restraint, only using a few of the available symbols. As I've shown in this sample here, I've got the lane, I've got the steps, I've got the flow. And I don't use the BPMN gateways. I do use the event symbols. Clients find those helpful. The gateways end up being visual clutter for a lot of business people. For instance, if I have a decision, I'm going to use the verb decide and my flow line is going to split. It's like coming to a fork in the road. I can go left or I can go right, but I can't go either. So no business person has trouble realizing that that is a decision. I could add the exclusive gateway, but I don't think it's particularly helpful. Similarly, over here, I have some parallel steps with parallel flows going into them, parallel flows coming out of them. I could add the parallel gateway, but again, I think it's just going to add some visual clutter. For the inclusive or, I borrow a technique from data modeling. I put a dashed arc over the flow lines and the label one or more. So where have we been? Well, we've looked at some principles for effective use of swim lane diagrams, and I've covered a couple of them in more detail. Next time in the webisode on managing detail, we'll look at the last two. I think you're going to find that one quite interesting. So thank you for watching, and as always, feel free to contact me with questions or comments, or if you're interested in the various two-day workshops that I teach. Historically, all around the globe, three, four, five continents a year, the last several months virtually from my office in Vancouver. So thanks again. I hope to hear from you and see you next time.